How many are ready for the word? I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And this is going to be great. Oh, there. Oh, okay. I thought I was going to have to wing it. But the Lord came through with Siri. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to start a series today called, What Are You Thinking? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what are you thinking? How many know it's important what you're thinking? And today I'm going to preach the first message of this series called, What Are You Thinking? And the first message of this series is simply called, Believing God. How many know we can complicate the gospel? But I believe God in this moment, at least in my life, is taking me back to a place where we recognize the power of simply believing God. And I want to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. And I am typically accustomed to reading a number of scriptures. Sometimes people fault me for reading too many scriptures. I'm not sure how you can read too many scriptures. We don't fault people for looking through too many Facebook posts. You can't have too much of the word. But today, I want to read one scripture. I only need one scripture for this assignment. It's found in the faith chapter of Hebrews. Chapter 11, verse 6 reads like this. But without faith... It is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a reward. He or she that comes to God must believe that he is. He is healer. He is deliverer. He is savior. He's the king of glory. He's the soon coming king. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Gary Keelan would say he's the avenue of access, the boulevard of blessing. He's the causeway of Christianity. He's the deliverer of deliverers. I'm not going all the way to Z. But how many believe he is? And not only is he, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Without faith, it's impossible. And today we want to talk about believing God. Look at someone and tell your neighbor, neighbor, what are you thinking? Jesus, help me today to articulate in this place what you have revealed to me in my private time of prayer and seeking you. And I pray a spirit of wisdom and revelation would rest upon this house and that people who have been afar will be brought near to you today. Oh yes, Lord, by your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Believing God. A.W. Tozer, how many have ever heard of A.W. Tozer? Tremendous theologian from a bygone generation. A.W. Tozer once said, the most important thing a person can do is to think rightly about God. What you and I think about God is absolutely the most critical and the most important thing about our lives. Our conception of God and the thoughts about God that we think and we entertain will be massively important in determining the kind of life we live and the kind of spiritual future we have. We are living in a season right now where I believe the enemy's assignment is to negatively impact our mind in its thinking about God. There is an attack of the enemy that I see happening, and I am not talking about in anecdotal little here, little there, a couple over here, uh, 
It's not anecdotal. There's an attack of the enemy right now where the enemy is trying to shake the confidence we have in God, change our perspective of God, and affect our ability to trust in God. We are living in what the Bible said in the last day, many men's hearts will fail them for fear. I want you to know today, fear does not come from God. I have Bible to tell you, fear does not come from God. God has not given you a spirit of fear. If you have it, it came from hell. And if you don't want it, send it back there. God doesn't give a spirit of fear. He gives us love, dunamis power, and self-control. And what we have to do in this moment, it is absolutely the most important thing you can do in the season that we are in is to protect your mind and guard your thinking. When the Bible said in the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, that the shield of faith helps you quench fiery darts, that means fiery darts really do exist. And like heat-sinking missiles, Satan will send them into your soul in an attempt to poison your thinking and to reduce your trust in God. But there is a shield called faith that if you will lift it up and open up your mouth and in the middle of hell breaking loose and fiery darts being sent to your soul, just open up your mouth and throw up your hands and tell hell and every demon that's howling and hissing, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I don't understand what I'm going through, but I still believe all things work together for the good to them that love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. It's not time to cower in fear. Fear does not come from God. And if you lay down or wake up or walk through life and something overcomes you that causes you panic, and causes you to wake up losing sleep, send it back to hell, because it didn't come from God. And this is what the enemy plays with minds about. He wants us to think God is against us. God is the cause of all the problems, and God is the tormentor. God is the issue. I'm telling you right now, had it not been for God, we'd all be dead. And the enemy wants to twist our thinking, and he wants to cause us to reduce our faith and not trust and believe in God. But today I want to show why what you think about God is important and how your thought life will impact your real life. How many know your thought life will impact your real life? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, The message today will be illustrated with two groups of people. And it's a contrast in the the differences between the two and how these two different groups of people thought about God. And I want you to first put your finger on Mark chapter 6, and then I want you to put your finger on Matthew uh, Matthew chapter 8. And I want to draw a contrast between these two group, groups of people and show you the different ways that they thought about God and how what they thought about God impacted their life. Mark 6, let's read this together. Then he went out from there, verse 1. Mark 6, verse 1. Then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. Now he's in Nazareth, his own country. Say his own country. He's in Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath, begins to teach, and they were astonished. Where, they said, where did this man, everybody say man, where did this man get these things? 
And what wisdom is this with, which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? Is this not the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at Jesus. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is without honor except in his own country, among his relatives and among his own house. Now he could do no mighty miracles there. The word mighty miracles, underline it if you will. In the Greek it is dunamis. What what the word is teaching us here is that there was no manifestation of the power of God to speak of. There was no dunamis manifestation. There was no power of God being manifested except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. Look at this, verse 6, there are two times in your whole Bible when God marveled. It literally means Jesus was overwhelmed. He was shocked. There's only two times in the Bible it says this, and this is one of those times. He marveled. He was blown away. He was absolutely shocked at their unbelief. Their unbelief staggered him. He literally found himself in an atmosphere of unbelief even though the God who put the world together was standing in their midst they could not see it thus they did not believe it now watch this what you believe about God will determine who he can be for you and what he can do to you and through you he's standing in the midst of a people who should be above all others more positioned to receive the blessing of heaven. This is where Jesus was born. This is where Jesus was raised. This is where Jesus lived. If any people should be hungry for God and know that he is the son of the living God, it should be Nazareth. But instead of them believing him as God, instead of looking at him and saying, this is the son of Yahweh, they looked at him and said, this is the son of Mary. Instead of looking at him and seeing him as the first born among many brothers, they looked at him and said, is this not the brother of James and Judas and Joseph and, and, and his sisters are here with us? Instead of looking at him and seeing him as the Christ, they looked at him and saw him as a carpenter. And because he taught with great wisdom and power and healed a few people, they were offended. Why were they offended? What does that even mean? It means that when he began to operate in the supernatural, they were trapped and fell into offense because they only knew him after the natural. How can you operate in the supernatural when we know you by the natural? You are Mary's son. Well, that is partly true, but he's also Yahweh's son. And if you only see him as Mary's son and you don't see him as Yahweh's son, he can only build you a bench with wood because in the natural, he's a carpenter. God, I feel like preaching. But if you know him as Yahweh's son, he can heal your blind eyes and set your spirit free because he's not just a carpenter. He's the Christ and he's the anointed one who walks in heaven's anointing. And here's what I want to tell you about Nazareth. He never went back there. Scripture never tells us of another time when Jesus went back to Nazareth. Why? It's his hometown. Why? It's where he was raised. Wouldn't he go back there? Yes, he would, but he didn't. Why? Because there's something about the people in Nazareth that put a lid and a limit on the power of God. What they thought about Jesus hindered him from being everything he came to be for them. What does God want to do for you? Who does God want to be in your life? What is he wanting to release into your spirit that he can't 
because we're living in Nazareth. If I could just say it like this, I don't know if it'll make sense or not. God's trying to deal with the Nazareth people. The people who don't deny Jesus, they just reduce him. I, I, I can't go to hell. I'm not going to deny him, but I'm just not going to believe he is who he says he is. I'm not going, I'm going to believe him enough to be savior, but when it comes to that supernatural dunamis power stuff, I just don't know. See, what the Lord is doing in this hour, family, is he's showing Nazareth, you're going to have to honor me because I'm not going to stay in an environment where you're not going to, to honor me for who I am. I'm not just Mary's son. I am Yahweh's son. I, I, I'm not just another man I am I am the God man God wrapped in flesh from the foundation of the world the very express image of God in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily this is not just another man and if you and I are Nazareth people it means that we have just enough respect to go hear what he has to say but we don't have enough faith to believe that when hell is breaking loose and when things rack our body with pain he has the power to turn it around. He's not just a God who sympathizes oh he'll sympathize but he's a God who will heal your body and deliver your mind and set the darkest captive free. Do you believe God? Or are we just living in Nazareth where we go to the synagogue to get a nugget? Oh, you ever heard people, they got little books. They write down their nuggets. I write down nuggets all the time. But until those nuggets become revelation that you add your faith to, I don't want to live in Nazareth. Jesus never went back to Nazareth. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you why he couldn't stay in Nazareth. Because they thought. Look at your neighbor and say, what are you thinking? They thought. Yeah, he's doing some pretty amazing stuff. But this is just another man. I'm telling you this morning, and I'm moving on to point two. Churches are full of Nazareth people who come to hear what he's got to say, who come to see what he'll do for others, but they get offended because in their thinking, they don't believe God in a way that releases him to be everything he wants to be in their life. What you think about God matters. While we are worshiping on Sunday and songs are being sung, I wanna say this to you. I have absolutely no problem with people posting God moving and pictures and all this stuff, but if we spend more time in our phone, with our face, on our phone in the house of God, while we are here on Sunday, I'm not going to get no help and I'm not mad. I'm just telling you, where is the honor in the house of the Lord? Well, we're in a new generation. That might be half our problem. Because I'm going to tell you right now, when he walks in the room, all attention should be on God. All, all attention should be on him. And I know there are exceptions and I'm not talking about making a, I want you to post stuff. I think it's wonderful to testify. I'm just talking about people who don't even give thought to the fact that the king of glory is in the room. I don't want to offend him. I want him to know you are the reason why we showed up this morning. I didn't get up and get ready because I came to be seen. I got up and got ready because I want more of him. And if he don't show up, I should have stayed home. I want to be in the presence of God. I want to hear his voice. I want to feel his touch. I want to know his power. I want the sick to be healed and the lost to be found. Broken homes to be put back together. I want him to know we believe he's the best thing on planet earth nobody like Jesus my God nobody like him 
If you think like Nazareth, if you live in a Nazareth mentality, he's just another, you will hinder who he can be and what he can do in your life. Now, take that thought, put a comma on it, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Is this okay? Matthew 8, verse 5. Now Jesus came to Capernaum, and a centurion came to him pleading with him. He said, Lord, my servant, one translation said my son, my son or my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come. Listen to this. I need you to underline this because I'm going to go back and revisit this in a moment. Jesus said, I will come to your house and heal him. Everybody see that? Are y'all with me? Can we put, I don't know if we can put it up on the screen now, but we're in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 5. Starting with verse number 5, I'm now in verse number 7. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Everybody see that? Verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Only speak a word. Underline that. Only speak a word. And if you do that, my servant will be healed. Verse 9. For I am also a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and what happens? He goes. I say to one, come, and what happens? He comes. And to my servant, I say, do this, and what happens? He does it. In other words, the centurion, now let's first of all understand two things, where Jesus was and who Jesus was talking to. Number one, he's in Capernaum. Everyone say Capernaum. Fishing village. It's full of both Jews and Gentiles. And the man that happens to walk up to Jesus here is a Gentile, a centurion. He is a Roman captain over 100 Roman soldiers. This man is not a Jew. He's not even necessarily next on Jesus' calendar. But hunger will position you for an appointment with the King of Glory. Even if you're not next, your hunger can cause you to become next. Y'all miss what I just said. I said, even if you're not next, your hunger can cause you to become next. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, I'm next. You better tell them like you believe what you're saying. Say, neighbor, I am next because I'm hungry for more of him. I don't care how jacked up you are, how many appointments you've missed, how many times you've blown it, stay hungry and hunger will cause you to become next on God's calendar. Somebody say amen. He said, if you, he said, if I say go, he goes. If I say come, he comes. If I say do it, he does it. I know this centurion Gentile is saying, I know that I'm a man under authority and I have authority. And if I have authority, I can tell one to go and he goes. If I have authority, I, I, I tell one to come and he comes. Authority, this is what the centurion is processing and saying. Authority causes words to make things happen. I'm gonna rewind it. Authority causes words to make things happen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. And God said, not God did, God said, let there be light and there was 
Why was there light? Because God said. Now, pastor, don't go down this faith road. You know, we don't want to hear about all this word stuff. That's why so many people live in defeat. Because they think what is written will help them, but it can't help you until you open up your mouth and say what God already said. Are you hearing me? The centurion looks at Jesus and says, you don't have... Jesus says, I'm going to come to your house and heal this kid. And the centurion says, you don't have to. All you have to do is say a word. Because I understand authority, Jesus. I tell my servants to go, they go. I tell them to come, they come. I tell them to do it and they do it. And I look at you, Jesus. And I, a Gentile centurion, see in you, Jesus Christ, the authority of heaven. And I see it so much that I believe if my words cause my servants to do what I say, then your words will cause the power to heal my servant who ain't even here but don't have to be because if you say it right here, it'll happen back home where he is. I don't know if I'm making sense. And Jesus says, watch this, second time in all the Bible, Jesus marvels. When's the first time? I just read it to you. He was blown away at their lack of faith. And the second time he marveled is when he looked at a Gentile. And the Gentile said, I made a connection today. How many know this connection came to the Gentile by the Holy Ghost? I made a connection today. I declare it and my authority causes it to happen. Jesus, I look at you and I declare you to be the son of God. And because you are the son of God, if you declare my son to be healed, one word. How many know it don't take a whole Bible? I'm thankful for the whole Bible. I believe in the whole Bible, but one scripture can set you free. One word from God. And so Jesus steps back and says, he marveled. And he tells everybody standing around him, I haven't found this kind of faith in all of Israel. Now this tells me something about what you're thinking. It matters and it's known to God. And I don't want to offend you with this, but there are levels of faith. Now, you may not like that, and you may say, well, we're out. the ground is level at the foot of the cross, and I would totally agree with you. Everyone can access that kind of faith, but not everyone is willing and courageous to access that kind of faith. Some people have enough faith to get to heaven, and that's all the faith they have. Jesus, Savior, period, end of my experience, He's more than my savior. Can can anyone testify to what I'm talking about? He is more than a savior. He is a savior. Oh, what a savior. I said, oh, what a savior. And yes, I'll even be willing to say that salvation is the greatest miracle he could ever work. But you have put a period and you have put a finish line at the launching pad. Salvation is not where we end up. Salvation is where we begin. I want today to teach this last part and pray it releases you to believe God and to think about God. You say, Pastor, you know, just let us just chill. No, Paul said, now unto him who is able. Not unto him who might, unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think does that sound like a god who's just trying to give you baseline christianity or does that sound like a god who wants to blow your mind now watch this jesus said i've never found so great a faith in all of israel and then he stops and says i want you to know this 
Many will come from the east and west. This is Gentile people. Many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How many know if you're a Jew, it gets no better than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Everybody in the Jewish world wants to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All Jewish people look forward to the day where they get to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But look what Jesus says. Many will come from the east and west. That's not Jews. That's Gentiles. Gentiles who weren't even part of the family are going to sit down with the Jewish patriarchs. And the centurion is going to sit down with Abraham. The hillbilly is going to sit down with Abraham. The gangster's going to sit down with Abraham. Those who've turned their life over to Jesus, those who've given their heart to Christ, those who've repented and said, Lord, I'm a, I'm a messed up, screwed up soul, but if you'll have mercy on me, I'll save you. I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Those people are going to come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because of what they believe about Jesus. When you trust him, it gives you access into God that you'll never have without trusting and believing. Watch this. Then he looks at the man and said, this is the most important phrase in the entire scripture, this story. As you have believed, it is done unto you. Look at it. As you have believed, it is done unto you. Now here's what I want to propose to you. For just a few more minutes, watch this. Jesus was going to the man's house. Why? Because everyone Jesus had ever healed, he went and touched them. Jesus was actually going to go to the man's house. How many are thankful God will meet you where you are? God will meet you where you are. But this man shot Jesus. Because Jesus was going to go to his house and heal him, but the man unlocked something in Jesus that had never been unlocked before. Your faith can release God. Now, I want you to hear me because some people are going to say, that's heretical. Listen to me. God can do anything he wants to do at any time, any way he wants to do it. Amen? But how many know faith is what God will honor It's not that God couldn't or can't. Jesus shows us in Mark 6 that their lack of faith hindered him from doing what he wanted to do for them. Your faith does play a role in who God can be and what God can do for you. But that's not just in a negative sense. It's also in an affirmative sense. If you will believe God in ways that no one else has believed God, it will release God to do in the earth through and in you what nobody else has ever seen him do. This is the first time anybody ever said, just say the word and it can happen. And when he said it, Jesus said, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I've never seen anybody who believes in the power of my word. But as you believe, it is done unto you. Wait, he said it, and when Jesus said it, immediately the young boy was healed. He wasn't even standing there. He was back home. Here's what's crazy. That man's faith unlocked a manifestation of power that caused Jesus to make Capernaum his headquarters for the rest of his ministry. He never went back to Nazareth. But he moved everything to Capernaum. Why would he move to Capernaum? Because he found a group of people who believed he was the Christ. And all he had to do was say the word. You don't even have to come to my house. I can be standing in church on Sunday morning and you can do whatever I need done back at my house if you'll just say the word. God is raising up a Capernaum company of people who do not need him to touch them every time. They don't need a pacifier every time. They don't need another promise. All they need is a word. All they need is for him to speak and they know that he is the God of all power. 
He is the God of all authority. He is the God that put the stripe in the zebra, the green in the grass, the wet in the water. He put the stars into place and called them by name. He said, let there be light and there was light. If he said it, he will do it. Man shall not live by bread alone and the bundle shia, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall accomplish what I send it to do and it shall not come back void. Heaven and earth will pass away but the word of God shall abide forever. There's power in the word of God. Say the word, Lord. The doctor said cancer. Say healing, Lord. The banker said you can't. Say I'm blessed, Lord. Kids running away from God. Say they've got a purpose and a plan and a future, Father. You know what? The devil's not after your joy. He's after the word about your joy. Devil's not after your, your physical well-being. He's after the word about your healing. Because if he steals the word, he can steal the faith. Because faith comes back. And hearing by the word of God. Now, I'm going to show you this and we're done. I hope this is helping. That man said, say the word. And when Jesus said the word, it happened. Jesus didn't rebuke the man for having the faith no one else had. Religious people would have heard that man say that and they'd be like, calm down. You're getting all in the flesh. Say the word. Sit down. He needs to come lay your hands on that boy. Because we ain't never seen that before. Word stuff. We need God to lay. You better get a preacher to lay hands on you if you're going to get healed. See, if that's where your faith is. I said, if that's where your faith is, then run yourself down here to the healing line and let somebody lay hands on you. There's no problem with that. But don't get mad when somebody from the Gentile nation, I said Gentile nation, screwed up, jacked up, messed up, all of it, walks in a dimension of faith that you haven't ever seen. Don't criticize them because they may be unlocking something from heaven that's getting ready to bless you. I don't need everybody in this church to get courageous and to get full of faith, but I need a handful of people too because if somebody in here will start, start believing God in radical ways, it will activate something in the spirit that will bless everybody in Chattanooga. You say, how do you know that? Because I read my Bible. Look at this, I'm done. He looks at the man and says, as you have believed it, so, so be it unto you. And the boy was healed. Look two verses later. Come on, I want you to see this. Your preacher's not making this up. This is real good. Verse number 16, Chadwick, put it on the screen for me. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out spirits by Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. He cast out spirits with a word and healed the sick with a word. Where did that come from? It came because one man in that city, I feel like preaching. He said, God, if you speak a word, all you gotta do is say it and it'll come to pass. And Jesus said, oh, something happened in Capernaum. Today, when that man said that, his faith opened up the heaven and activated an anointing that had never been released before and now I got a whole group of people who need a miracle and all they're waiting on is not a touch they're just 
waiting on a word. And Jesus said, you be healed. You be delivered. You be set free. You chains fall off. You yoke be destroyed. And everybody got set free by the word. Slap five people while I catch my breath and tell them the word. It ain't over. Five verses later, he gets on a boat, falls asleep, storm breaks out, disciples scared to death. He wakes them, they wake him up and said, Master, we're gonna perish. He said, where's your faith? Walks out on the, on the bow of the boat and what does he say? Peace be still. And the wind said, okay. And the wave said, sure. Why? Something got activated in God with one centurion who said, you don't have to come to my house. If I, had, I wish somebody would run for me that could run. I can't run, but I feel it in my feet. Hey, I can't run, but I feel it. Oh, Lord. I feel it in my feet right now. One word from the Lord. I don't need, oh yes, Sister Cheryl, I appreciate you helping me today. I, I don't need, he don't have to come to my house. He don't have to lay hands on my head. Oh, all I need is for him to touch my body with a word. Somebody who believes in the power of the word of God, jump up on your feet and begin to give him praise. Hold the word. Somebody say, speak, Lord. Somebody say, speak, Lord. Here's what I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to me as I heard this in my heart as I was reading this text. He said, Kevin, there are going to be people in your church that activate with their faith and their belief. They're going to activate and release in a city. Manifestations of my power that the city has never seen before. Are we going to be a Nazareth people? Or are we going to be a Capernaum people? Yeah. He made his headquarters in Capernaum. Why? Because there were some people in Capernaum that called a revelation that there was power in his word. I don't have faith in my faith. I have faith in the word of God. I'm not going to just speak my mind. I'm going to renew my mind. And walking with a renewed mind, speak the word the Spirit quickens to me. And your faith and my faith could activate, and I know that word sounds whatever, it's the only word and the best word I could think of to describe what happened in Capernaum when one man said, you don't have to come to my house. All you have to do, Lord, is speak the word. Men's hearts and women's hearts are failing them for fear in the moment we're living in. There is a collision occurring and faith doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this moment. 
hunker down, hold out. Riots, division, hate, malice. You look on social media, five minutes of the news, and you say, my God, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. But don't you buy the lie. I want to tell you this. I'm not telling you that it may not get worse. I'm telling you that while the worst gets worse, the better is going to get better. The cold will get colder and the hot will get hotter. The ungodly will grow in more ungodliness, but the godly will draw closer to the heart of God. And while systems, structures, governments are crumbling, while the streets are filled with balance, hate, rage, while sons and daughters are dying in our streets, while the love of many will grow cold, there is a remnant. There is good news. Jesus still saves. The king is on the throne. God is in control. He hasn't lost his power. The devil's not fighting God. They're not equal. The devil is under the feet of our risen Savior. The foot of our Lord may be bloodied, but it is only because he crushed the head of the serpent when he died and rose again. The tomb is still empty. Jerusalem still has a testimony that the tomb is empty. And there's power in his word. How many want to hear him speak to your heart? Next week, I'm going to talk about how to change your thinking. Today, we talked about believing God and we began this series on what are you thinking. But next week, I'm going to talk about how to change your thinking. How many know if you can change your mind, you can change your future? Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're not moving yet. Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I need Jesus. I want to believe God. I believe your word you preach today, Pastor. I believe Jesus is the Son of God and I need him to save me. You're watching online. You're in this room today. If you are away from God, if you die today, you say, Pastor, that's manipulation. That's not manipulation. That's Bible. Tomorrow is promised to no man. A a fool has said in his heart, no God. Don't tell him no today. He's knocking on the door of your heart. Jesus will never break the door down. He will always knock on your heart's door. And if you will let him in, he will save you. Someone in this room has fallen away from the Lord. You've left your first love. You've known Jesus. You've been to church. But if you die today, you know you're not right with God. He's knocking today. Jesus is wanting to save. He's wanting to heal backsliders. The book of Jeremiah, the third chapter says he will heal their backslidings. I want you to know today, Micah chapter 7 says, Though I sit in darkness, he will be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Why? Because I have sinned against God. But he will give me justice. And he will forgive our iniquities and sins and remember them no more. There is good news today. If your heart is laden with sin, if your heart is laden with failure, if you have fallen and fallen and you're away from God and you've, you've even given up, but today you feel that pulse coming back into your heart. You feel that little flame flickering again. You can come back home to Jesus. He will never cast you out. Today he will save you. I don't care if you've ever known him or never known him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's leaving, no one's moving. Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I need to give my heart to God today. In the, in the shape you're in just like you are if I'm preaching and talking to you and you want to give Jesus your life lift your hand when I say three one, two, three yes, 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 yes 
Yes, yes, you can put your hands down. God bless you, everyone. If your hand was up, or it should be, I'm coming down these steps right now to stand in this altar and to wait on anybody who would say today, I'm not leaving like I came. I want the Lord Jesus to forgive my sins and give me new life. If you lifted your hand, or you should have, come meet me right now. Come on, come right out of your seat. No one's gonna get in your face. We're not gonna, we're not, we're not, we're not gonna do that. We just wanna love you. I wanna give my heart to Jesus. I wanna give my, come on big guy, come on. Come on pal, come on. Come on, come on, I'm giving my heart to the Lord. I'm not leaving, come on, come on. Come on, come on sweetheart, come on sir. I'm not, come on, anyone else? I can't leave like I came. I can't handle my sins. I can't deal with them myself. I can't take care of this. I need Jesus, come on. I need Jesus, I don't wanna leave like I came. I don't wanna go home the same way. Anybody else? He'll save you. If you'll just say yes to him, he'll take you in right now. I surrender all. I need elders and pastors. I surrender all, all to Jesus, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Everybody should be able to sing that. Come on, I surrender all. Lift your hands and say it again. I surrender all. I surrender all to thee. My blessed Savior. They're praying for salvation and he's a savior to those who call on his name. But I really believe in my heart before we leave today, I want us to pray corporately for this house to experience an elevation in faith. How many want God to change your thinking personally so that you can believe God for greater? I'm gonna talk next week about the carnal mind You need to be here, not because I'm preaching it, but because I believe it's going to be revelation that's going to set people free from limited thinking. But I wanna pray for you right now. If today's word you receive in your heart and you want to believe, begin to believe God at his word and that his word has power over your life, just lift your hands right now so we can pray together. Lord, you see every hand that's lifted. So many people in this place who are coming into, oh, I feel the Lord's, a spirit of wisdom and revelation being crowned upon heads right now. If you receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation and want the power of God to begin to flow in supernatural ways, come on, throw up both hands right now. I know it, listen, it's early still. I'll let you out in a minute, but you could grab something in this moment that will change the trajectory of your life. We will not be Nazareth people, Holy Spirit, We will not be Nazareth people. You are not just a carpenter. You are the Christ. You are not just Mary's son. You are the son of the living God. Oh, hallelujah. I declare right now in the name of Jesus that a spirit of wisdom and revelation is falling on people who are hungry to hear the voice of God in deeper ways, in more supernatural manifestation. Father, you are not just the carpenter. You are the Christ, Jesus. And we love you, Lord. 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 Lord. Is there someone in this room today? You have a mass or a tumor? You have a mass or a tumor? Maybe you know someone who has a mass or a tumor. If you have a mass, a cyst, a tumor, something in your body, and you believe God can heal you of it, I want you to lift your hand right now. Come here, sweetheart. Anyone else? You have a mass, sir? Anybody else? If you do, I want you to lift your hands. I'm not gonna lay hands on you, but I want you to stop right there and lift your hands. In the name of Jesus. 
I speak to that tumor. I speak to that mass. Go from her in the name of Jesus and do not return. Mass, the word of God says you are dismissed in the mighty name of Jesus. Dear sister, lift your hands in praise. It's gone in Jesus' name. I believe it to be so. Somebody praise God. Gone by the power of God. Gone and dismissed never to return again in the name of the Lord. Someone has an eye issue. If you have an eye issue, lift your hand right now. An eye problem, you have an eye issue. Don't don't lift your hand if you don't. I want to know who I'm praying for. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we speak to the eyes. And we declare you'll become perfect, 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 perfect vision. 2020 vision in 2020. It'll be a year of testimony for your vision. And it's not just natural vision, but God is restoring spiritual vision. And I declare that cataracts and glaucoma is leaving now. Diabetes has hindered somebody's eyes, but the eyes are being healed. And I command it to be so by the word of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, every person with an eye issue, I speak to the eye. And I declare the eye is healed by the power of the word of God. We send the word to the eye. We send the word to the eye and we command the eyes to be healed by the power of God. Somebody has colon issues, colon issues. I I believe there's someone in this room right now that's dealing with diverticulitis, Crohn's disease. If you have issues in you, I know I'm not trying to impose myself on your private life, but the spirit of God said colon issues are gonna be healed. If you got an issue in your colon, lift your hand right now. If there's problems in that digestive system, lift your hands, lift your hands. I'm gonna pray. In the name of Jesus, I speak to that issue now. And by the power of the living God, I send the word to the colon of, uh, and the issue in their colon. And we speak, he, somebody's watching online. Your, your digestive system is being healed now by the power of God. We send the word. Someone in this room in their digestive system is being healed. May the word of God go to that issue now. Dismissed 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 by the power of God in the name of Jesus lift your hands and worship the king of glory I worship you Lord I worship you Lord in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Depression, lift your hands. Depression, if you are living in depression, lift your hands right now. A mass deliverance of depression this morning. I said a mass deliverance of depression. This demon spirit has no authority over the mind of the child of God. I recognize there are seasons of heaviness, but they're not supposed to last forever. I said they have no authority to last forever. If you need deliverance from it, lift your hand right now. Lift your hand right now. The word's about to smash this depression. The word of the Lord is going to smash it. If you have it and you're wrestling with it, don't be ashamed of it. Just lift your hand. In the name of Jesus, we speak to that spirit of heaviness and we declare that the oil of joy is coming on those with a spirit of heaviness. The garment of praise is coming on the banda kanda mandashe in their mouth. There is a deliverance happening now. The brain is being rewired by the power of God. The spirit of heaviness has to go. The spirit of heaviness has to go. Depression, be gone in the name of Jesus. Now, lift your hands, everyone who wants joy. Everyone who wants joy. I hear the Holy Ghost saying, it is no miracle for me to give my people joy. My kingdom is a kingdom of joy. 
I hear the Spirit of God saying joy is your portion. If you believe that, receive it now. Joy is your portion. You say, Pastor, come lay hands on me. No, catch the word. Joy is your portion. Joy. Joy. Lay hands on your neighbor that came with you. Joy. 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 Deep abiding Jesus joy in his name right now. In his name right now. I seal every word. I declare it to be done and so we will be people of the word of the Lord. If you believe the word and you're going to live by it, give him the best praise you've given him all day long. Come on. Seven on the oximeter 125 beats a minute if you don't help me praise him I'm gonna praise him all by myself How? shout unto God with a voice of triumph Somebody walk around and praise him. Somebody lift up your hands and praise him. The word of the Lord has power. The word of the Lord has authority. I feel the fire of God in this room. Well, this is a good place. To seal it. To tell the devil you won't have my joy, my faith, the word. You can't steal this word out of my heart, devil. This is the word of the Lord. Go in its power. Go in its protection. May this be the greatest week you've experienced this year. In Jesus' name, somebody said amen. If I could hug all of you, I would, but I'm tired and I'm going to change clothes.